Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have a couple of announcements we get before we get started. First of all, welcome to Grace Christian Church and welcome to everyone in watching with us virtually. Our first announcement is from our favorite DCE, Laura Lee. We'll let her take over. Is that I would like you to be a part of it. Uh, 
Um, I'm not only putting uh, basic information about sort of the number of nanograms, but also um, having people be a part of it um, so that they can represent the different numbers. Um, and there's more information in the bulletin insert. I can only say so much up here because I only have so much time. Uh, but if you'd like to be part of it or if you want more information about it, um, just let me know. Uh, contact me if that one. Great. And I also have a little trailer to kind of show you. This isn't what the episode's going to look like, but this is uh, kind of the people I've interviewed so far. And if this, you know, there's some people that know about it, some people that don't know about it. Uh, but the point is getting different um, looks, uh, perspectives on things. So here's the trailer. <laughs> Hi, my name is Elizabeth. My name is Kate and Stephen Senti. My name is Brittany Blanco. Hi, my name is Sumi Chia. My name is Anne Bronson. Hello, I am Isaac Tolkien. My name is Sherry Smith. Uh, I'm Anne Lee Young. My name is Lauren Wilcox. My name is Nick Locker. I'm Michael Sanderson. My name is Daniel Hickman. Do you know a lot about the Andy Room? I do not. I just know what, you know, when you and I originally talked about it when you first came here and you had me do a little. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know much about what we did. Yeah, that is. Um, not a lot. I know that there are nine numbers. I don't know much about my number. I do know the Enneagram is a weighted group of personalities. Do you know anything about the Enneagram? No. You don't? Okay. Sure. I don't know exactly what it is, really, to be honest. I know that it's like, kind of like a big thing right now. When I first started learning about Enneagram, I was a little bit skeptical about it because I was like, why do we need to worry about ourselves so much and knowing ourselves so, you know? But then once I discovered that knowing myself will help me interact with others better. It has made a really big difference, especially in my faith and in the way that I view the world and, and um, other people, and especially the way I receive the grace of God. I think Jesus paid attention to the needs of other people, and the Enneagram helps me to pay attention to what other people might need. And it has allowed me to start pushing myself, not not necessarily towards myself as my core identity, but it's shown me how Jesus is intersecting those lies that I tend to believe when I'm stressed out, um, how it intersects my own, uh, my own pride, and helps me to see more clearly the path that Jesus is calling me to walk down. And that's what the Enneagram can do. It can give you language so that you can move forward. It doesn't give you language so you can like be your own little number and you don't have to move or change. It gives you language that then you want to move out because I'm one of those people that will keep pouring into others' cups and then I'll realize in the midst of doing that that I have nothing else to give. So it kind of um, gives me a time to press pause and kind of have God fill that cup for me because I can't do it myself. If you have any questions or anything like that, if you want to be part of it, just let me know. And I think we'll all look forward to uh, something like a spring release of the highly anticipated uh, series by More Lake. So we will, that, that's exciting. And if you'd like to help out, just contact her. Uh, be on the big screen. Our big screen. Other announcements, the Cincinnati Zone uh, annual LWML Fall Retreat is September 26th. It's a Zoom meeting. So if you've never gone to an LWML retreat because it's too far away, well, now you just need your computer, your laptop, the fall. The only other announcement is that we're starting a new sermon series today. Uh, the next, this week and the next five weeks, we're going to be talking about putting it all together and how do we, focusing on how do we live out our faith Put the different pieces together today. Take the introduction, then we'll talk head, heart, hands, feet, and eyes. And how does, how does being a Christian, how can we use these things? How does it affect the different parts of our body and how do we use them to God's glory? So that'll be our sermon series for the next several weeks. I think that covers all our announcements, so we'll begin with the ringing of the bell and our opening. <laughs>
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. Almighty oh, God, merciful Father, I, the poor miserable sinner, can confess unto you all my sins and iniquities, with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I have prayed you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sovereignty of that of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful king. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all. And in this debt, and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Continue with the pinchers. How great are your works, O Lord! It is good to give thanks to the Lord. Sing praise to your name, O Most High. To declare your steadfast love in the morning. And your faithfulness by night. To the music of the lute and the harp. To the melody of the heart. For you, O Lord, have made me glad by your work. And the works of your creation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. How great are your works, O Lord! Your thoughts are great. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning for me. If 
If I say to the wicked, a wicked one, you shall surely die. You do not speak to one the wicked to turn from his way. That wicked person shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to return from his way, and he does not turn from his way, that person shall die in his iniquity. But you shall have delivered your soul. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from Romans chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For it is in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our service, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the Lord. <laughs> Was incarnate by the Holy 
Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and who was made in him. And was crucified also for us in the conscious time. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended to heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who stood by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. I think we have a, a little video now. Uh, no, no, no. All right, we continue with our sermon hymn, Christ Be My Man. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how you're going to put it all together? Maybe there's a project at work or some home renovation. That the puzzle. Often the best way to start is to take it one piece at a time. Our sermon series, Putting It All Together, is focusing on how to put our faith into practice. If we are living sacrifices, Paul encourages us to be, then all of our life can be used in some way to God's glory. How hands on can you be? Your faith never affects your How is our mind renewed and transformed by the gospel? Where should a Christian walk or look? Join us and let the Holy Spirit help put it all together, one piece at a time. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, Putting it together maybe is slightly more complicated than putting it together in Mrs. Potato Head, but thank you, Claire, for letting me use that. Uh, uh, but we will be puzzling together over the next several weeks about how we put our faith into action. There's uh, something very satisfying about putting the last piece of the puzzle together, whether it's a 12 piece puzzle or a thousand piece puzzle when you put work into something it, it's great to see all your hard work pay off one of the most uh, of course most people don't do a uh, most people don't do a puzzle uh, that they can complete in just a minute or two it usually takes some time and, and concentration and perhaps a lot of squinting as you look closely and try to get those pieces put together 
Well, over the next six weeks, we might do a little bit of squinting as we puzzle out how to put our faith into practice. And the way we're focusing on that is just focusing on the specific things that different parts of our bodies can do and how we might have a Christian head, if that makes sense, or Christian hands, uh, a different way of breaking it down. How does our faith change how we think? or feel, for instance? Or how does our faith navigate from our head and our heart to our hands and eyes and feet? How does faith change how we see and interact with this world in which we live in? Before we get down to the nitty gritty though, we're going to start with uh, an overview. Like all parts of our faith, sanctification, which is a fancy term for holy living or, or living out the Christian life, starts with Jesus. That's why Paul waits until the second half, the back half of the moments, before he jumps into a bunch of application and practical advice that we see a little bit of in our reading for today. Before we, before we, uh, before we get down to the nitty gritty, we're starting with an overview, like all of our own. Before we think about what we should do, though, know, we have to realize, first of all, first things first, what God has done for us. What did Jesus do? Well, pretty simply, he did it all. Jesus didn't just give us a, a gentle nudge in the right direction with the cross. It's great sanctification, or I mean, saved by grace is more than a coupon for 50% off of, of God's goodness or, or eternal life. Early in Romans, Paul puts it this way, now apart from the righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. Uh, there are, for all who believe, there is no difference for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace and the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And this is a pretty fundamental Lutheran teaching, but it's it's easy for us to lose sight of. And that's this, right? We're saved by grace. We don't earn God's grace. Instead of thankfulness for all that God has done for us, we live out lives of gratitude. No one has to force us to do this. Rather, the Holy Spirit and the example of Christ motivate us so that we want to live our lives further. Now, to be clear, again, as we're going to spend a lot of time talking about how we should act, what we should do as Christians, let's make it 100% clear. God doesn't change how much He loves you if you say more prayers or do more nice things. He loves and redeems you 100% already. We just want to show love to others. Uh, because Not because we have to earn holy points, but simply because we've experienced what a wonderful gift the grace of God is. And we want to share that experience with others. And God has done so much for us, we want to do just a little for others. I say all that because there's some things where the order matters, right? A lot of things, really. But, for instance, we're at, I think they, well, I think it was last night they won, right? Was that the one last night? Right. Yes, okay. We got some reds. Yeah. Reds won. And in baseball, some things have the first things first. And you can't ever get to second base. If you're a runner, you never get to first base, right? You, you can't run straight to second base. That's the error that the kids first learn in the game. Uh, saved by grace is first base for us. We've got to get to first base, accepting and giving thanks for God and for grace before we can get to second base, sanctification. But we'll probably do it, but I take it for granted, I guess, that, that most of us kind of get that. We've experienced God's grace. We don't earn God's favor by doing good, but nonetheless, God calls to do good things. In fact, in Romans chapter 12, Paul encourages us to worship God. But he doesn't just say come to church and sing songs. What does he say? He says offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. For this is your spiritual act of worship. You see, God is not primarily interested in our money or our accomplishments. God is 
interested in you, in your soul, in your being. He values you. Therefore, he, the way that we glorify him is not by paying him off like he's a tax man or something, but rather by living lives of sacrifice. God, and why does God want us to do this? Well, God wants us to live good lives because he wants a good world. And so he tells us the way to worship him is not by putting yourself first, but rather by living for a purpose, for God's purpose. Which again, he's shown us it's not that God's trying to take advantage of us, it's not that he wants us to spend all our time and money on him, but rather to steal words from the book of Micah. What does the Lord require of you? To do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. God wants us to live life of sacrifices, not simply to make him happy, but because he wants the world that we live in and others to be a better place. And when we put him first and think of others, it becomes a better place than if we put only ourselves So, uh, down to the living sacrifice. What is a living sacrifice? We use the word sacrifice today primarily as a metaphor. However, in the ancient world, sacrifice was an everyday reality. A sacrifice was uh, offering something, wine, grain, sometimes animals, an offering given to someone else. Typically, when we think of sacrifice, we're thinking of it being given to a god or to the Lord, God. Now, animal sacrifices may seem a bit barbaric, but, I mean, Let's just be real. We make animal sacrifices still today all the time. We just don't sacrifice to God. We sacrifice to ourselves, if you want to put it that way. Or we sacrifice them in the name of profit and money. We overproduce food because, frankly, we're willing to waste a bunch as long as it means we have our favorite food whenever we want. Simply eating beef or chicken, technically, Sacrifice the animal's life offered to sustain mine. Right? At least when I think about that, it makes it seem not so distant, um, but okay, it's just reality. And we do the same sort of thing, we just maybe don't want to think about it. Uh, in ancient Israel, also, there wasn't as much coinage and money to go around. They didn't have, they weren't printing paper money. So, in order to put your offering in the offering plate, you didn't write out a check and see what's in an envelope. Instead, you bought a sacrifice. Grain, or wine, or an animal, or something else, maybe. Likewise, if you wanted to buy something, you'd be as likely to offer a chicken for it as you would a $5 bill or some gold. Uh, or maybe you'd give some produce. You did more barter. Some Israel sacrifices, in fact, for that matter, were, they were, uh, many of them were eaten by people. I mean, people they had been sacrificed by the Levites or the priests of Israel. Others were simply burned as an offering to the Lord. The point being is sacrifices typically were no longer alive. Uh, that's kind of was included in, in the term sacrifice. But Paul in the light of Christ's death and resurrection, tells Christians that we ought to live out the reality of Christ's resurrection in our own lives. Because we've been crucified with Christ, and yet we live. But how should we live? Well, we, we've been redeemed. We've been rescued from sin and death. So it would be like a, a dog returning to its vomit. If we were to return to our folly, to going back to the, the tired and broken and, and uh, empty ways of living that sin once trapped us in. Instead, God calls us to live out lives of purpose. And have you ever met somebody who's had a, a near death experience? Uh, or maybe you've read a story about them. Or maybe they survived, uh, maybe they survived a serious illness. I think some people who I've talked with who had COVID recently have kind of grown for their appreciation for life and it has grown uh, because there was some real trepidation for a while. Often after surviving something like that, that's what happens. Well, Christians, we realize and we look at the scriptures that we've all had a near-death 
experience because we deserve death. We should have suffered eternal death for all our sins a thousand times over, and yet God keeps giving us. You sinned this week, I'm pretty sure. You said something terrible or you did something devious, and yet your Lord still loves you. And you don't have to worry about that sin anymore because you confessed it and God forgave it. You and I, we deserve to be punished. We deserve death. If we were just left on our own, even apart from sin, we would be headed for the grave at some point. And yet, God has brought us back from the grave. And so, we've had that near-death experience. And so, also, too, Christians, when we realize that, it gives us a greater appreciation for the life that God has given us in Christ. That's part of what it means to be a living sacrifice. Also, it's important to remember that Jesus, of course, was the very first living sacrifice. He was sacrificed. Slaughter is hardly a strong enough word to describe what happened to him. Jesus was killed and sacrificed as the high priest said, it's better that one man die for the people. Of course, the St. Peter, right? They would certainly have much rather Jesus die than their position to be threatened. But unbeknownst to them, Jesus wished for the exact same thing. He would rather die to keep us alive. God isn't asking us to do anything that he hasn't already done for us. God did sacrifice his only begotten son. This was the only way that he could cut through the sin and hardness of human heart and wake us up while simultaneously defeating death. And Jesus was not forced to do this, right? He was, that's important as we talk about these sacrifices also, that it's a willing sacrifice, starting with Jesus. He was a willing sacrifice because, make no mistake, Jesus certainly faced great distress and loneliness and despair, and of course, most obviously, physical torment, but he went to the cross of his own volition. He had multiple opportunities to turn around, but he kept saying, this is the Father's will, this is the plan of salvation, I'm going to do it, because he was willing to give up his life for the good of another, for your and my life, specifically. He who was God, perfect, righteous, and and by any sort of measurement we use, far more valuable and central to life and to the universe than you or I. Yet, he decided to sacrifice himself for our salvation. And that, too, gives us a wonderful and great appreciation for life that we did not earn, and yet, you have it right now. So we, too, having experienced the benefits of forgiveness, life, and salvation that Jesus won for us, we, too, learn to be willing sacrifices. God doesn't force us or as he wants to force us to live for him, but as we experience God's grace, we decide, we, we don't even decide, we simply start to want to do what God calls us to do. We want to, we see how love is a better way, how the way that God offers is better, and so we want to make uh, a positive difference. So, taking that for granted, I guess next week we'll start talking about what that means, with the renewing of our mind that Paul talked about. So get your head straight, or if you don't get it straight, we'll get it straight next week. But until then, go in the grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. We continue. We'll now have some music as we have our offering box in the back. If you'd like to take your offering in the back there at any point, or also you can do so online. Uh, Quick review for communion. I think we'll get the hang of this. We will be putting out three plates. The, the elders and myself will put out the plates and we'll put all the elements down. And then when we finish putting, when I finish putting the cup on, then three people can come up. And then when they're done, we'll keep We'll see you in our service.
who on this day overcame sin, death, and the devil, and won for us everlasting life. Therefore, the angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, <laughs>